All right. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. This is the first, but not last, seminar of this year. And uh, welcome again uh, to, uh, to our new colleagues uh, and hopefully and to everybody online uh, that is joining us. Uh, this year's seminar will be in this room, except for October 30th. We're still uh, negotiating. We might just start later and still be in this room at 1.30, um, since uh, uh, this room has a special status. As, as some of you know, we're not supposed to have classes in here or something like that. But uh, rules are there to challenge them, so uh, uh, that's what we do. Uh, and I said it publicly, and now it's online, but you, you cut that out. <laughs> um, uh, the seminar, I, I will announce the speakers uh, as we go. I had a cancellation for next week, that's why the next speaker is not there yet, but there's other people in line. And as I, I wrote to my colleagues, and I thought that that was also transferred to everybody else, but if you have a suggestion for this year, for the whole year, of a speaker that you would like to see, uh, or somebody that you really feel it would be important that visits the, the program also in person and so on, please do write to me and we'll uh, uh, invite this person, yeah? Uh, 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 if uh, uh, I will deem that, you know, it's a very good idea, which I don't doubt that, you know, your interests kind of align with the interests of the program in general. So I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a mixture already now, the people I have lined up, uh, uh, some of them are actually speakers that already talked in, in the seminar in the old days, you know, years ago. Uh, uh, and of course it's a new generation, so I think it's great that you, you know, that they revisit and we see what they're up to now. Uh, there's no really topical focus, I mean, uh, uh, if you ask me, I would be cheeky and I'd say cybernetics, you know, and then I, I kind of said it all. Uh, 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 in, in a way, even though our engineering colleagues would object to the use of this term or, you know, as a hyper-narrow term from the history of computation. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I think it's actually a very, very good description of what we're interested in. We'll try to bring a little, uh, a, a few more scientists uh, this year. Welcome. Yes, they're not a scientist, but a, science of, a scientist of letters has just joined. Uh, uh, Professor Dick Hevlich, uh, 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 thanks for coming. And uh, um, we will also have uh, uh, scientists and, uh, you know, artists, uh, engineers, the, the usual kind of combination. Uh, also some people more from really practical side of things like we always do, uh, uh, creators of software and uh, methodologies and then, you know, people more from, let's call it, a little bit more high level abstract, abstract level, so thinking. Uh, speaking of high level and uh, very practical levels of thinking, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, in person uh, Michael Candy, who is an artist that uh, I had the privilege to meet. Uh, now it's five years ago already. Um, uh, you know, COVID has really done something to looking back in the years uh, at, uh, at a hacker camp in Thailand on an island of all places in the jungle, actually. And I met Michael while he was troubleshooting uh, uh, very successfully his uh, uh, palm tree climbing robot that he created that week uh, 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 in that camp. And of course, that uh, immediately uh, uh, sparked a lot of uh, interest of who this person is. And then I, of course, discovered that he's this brilliant and beautiful artist that uh, builds machines uh, uh, and uh, uh, works with them. Uh, and Michael's from Australia. You will hear him. He clearly describes himself as a Luddite. So there you go. Uh, uh, for, for, for 
those of you who hopefully everybody understands the word, but if not, here's a prime, here's a kind of like a little live sample example of one. And uh, it's, uh, he's going to kind of drive us through, through his uh, uh, works and directions. As I mentioned also in our introduction, uh, Michael is going to be uh, a researcher uh, uh, in residence, or as I was told by our administration, uh, uh, what the designation to be used for him is, a junior specialist. Uh, uh, that's, you know, uh, that's, uh, the, the university has interesting ways of describing things. And I, I actually, you know, like the, the, the designation of junior specialist. Uh, um, and uh, he will be working with all of you. Uh, with, there will be some master classes in the winter and, and spring quarters on uh, probably uh, topic of robotics, and I know that him and Wei Hao are trying to hook up a collaboration dealing with, uh, um, of course, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, the fight between human and non-human entities or something like that. <laughs> we'll see what happens there. Um, yeah, welcome, Michael. Thanks for coming, and uh, thank you, everybody for joining the seminar and let's let's do this thanks thanks for coming everyone and yeah like marco said uh next year i'll definitely get some time to uh get to know all of you and kind of see what you're into and see how i can help or you know where things can go from there but um Today's presentation is by no means a guide. It's, uh, I'm, I'm essentially talking about my work, but I think you'll kind of understand the, the reason I chose to phrase it this way. And um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure everyone does, but uh, the Luddites was like a movement against the textile industry in the 1700s during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it was the first, like, sort of big case study of, of like humans revolting against machines. Um, so, uh, yeah. this is the only slide with text, but I, I wanted to have a sort of framing of like, kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, my ethics or methodology to work. And um, so, my skill set is born from like hardware hacking, taking things apart, um, figuring things out. Though. It might look like things are really well engineered. I can guarantee you they're not. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, there's a lot you can learn just visually and working with your hands. I think um, during the other the, the presentation of the labs, I, I was present for like last week. I think it was. They were talking a lot about you know just trying to make things as quickly as possible, and I think. That's something I've always embodied, and it doesn't always work. Things can fail, and that's that's totally fine. Um, I'd like to think that I take a brute force approach to a creative practice, and by that I mean like brute force methodology in hacking is sort of like trying every passphrase possible until things start to hit. And I think like I kind of do that with the work that I make. I'm, you will see a really diverse range of interests and subjects and methods that I'm going to present here today, and this is just also like a selection of things that kind of worked. <laughs> There's a lot that didn't. Um, the work I make is usually physical, uh, like mostly uh, actual um, robotic or, um, you know, kinetic items that are in physical space. So while we seem to be accelerating the digitization of everything, I think it's really important to try and bring people back to the physical. And so I feel like uh, technology at the moment is definitely reaching this kind of nexus where the digital world is flowing back into the physical more than ever and the, the physical world is um, kind of more manipulated by digital assets. And I, and I think it's really important to kind of flip that on its head. Um, consciously embodying media was a, loose way of me kind of phrasing that, I, I think, and you all will find this in, uh, as you pursue a creative practice, whether it's making music, writing, making sculptures, painting, whatever it is, um, you can't help but embody your own kind of 
personality and aspects of how you think or do things uh, are very hard to shake and I think it's really important to be conscious of that and kind of embrace that because that is part of the human element to making creative work and I think the human element is kind of getting diluted these days. Um, and technology should always be a tool and not the medium. So like uh, over the last decade we've survived many buzzwords from drones to 3D printing and like these things are like revolutions but also like now they're mundane and, and very commonplace technologies and I think it's really important to not get caught up in the zeitgeist of new technology and get too excited uh, and, and then just use that new media as the only outcome because it's, it's not really relevant to the human condition. And I'm still 100% human. Um, so this is a selection of early work. Uh, these works are much more kinetic sculptures, uh, things that weren't totally interactive. Uh, and yeah, let's just get into it, I guess. This is one of my um, earliest works. I think this is from like 2009, 2010. from my house and uh, parts of my bed frame, so <laughs> no, this won't be the last time I've worked with a bed frame in the slideshow, actually. Um, and um, so very early on, I was, I was just kind of interested in movement, uh, referencing a lot of kinetic, like very early kinetic works, like Jean Tenguli or uh, Theo Janssen, the beach sculpture guy who... Um, Periodically, people still send me his work as though I've never seen it. But, um, <laughs> uh, so just exploring really simple mechanisms, repetitive things, um, and building the, these little kind of contraptions. Uh, it was kind of... I wasn't very exposed to uh, like contemporary art, so I was referencing kind of really traditional uh, mechanical kind of things. Um, and this, of course, was my skill set. And so like these little, that little titanium chrysalis is actually made out of sheets from a saltwater pool filter. So like literally everything is found items, repurposed, and, and uh, the motors inside are the focusing motors from old uh, video cameras. Great resource for tiny DC motors if you, if you ever need them. But uh, yeah, I'd be... I, I, I kind of started making these works that were very uh, looking at nature and like referencing natural things. This was like a series on the lunar moth, and so I made each stage of the lunar moth like um, metamorphosis, and it was just kind of a kind of a challenge to see like how small and intricate I could make things um, with kind of primitive tools, actually. Um, Again, this, this was the, the sort of cylinder piston thing you saw on the table, just making these leaves breathe up and down. Feel free to like interject or ask questions along the way too, because um, I'm kind of just going to breeze through these, these early works and there might be something that you, I don't know, want to know about. Can you repeat the names of those two artists that you didn't mention? I definitely pronounced them wrong, but I could. <laughs> Jean, Jean Tinguely and Theo Janssen. Yeah. yeah. Theo Janssen. Um, so what was the surname of the first one? I'm sorry. Uh, Tinguely. T I N G U E L Y. Thank you. Yeah. I think he's Swiss. He, there's a really great museum of his in Basel. Um, 
So yeah, this was like, I don't know, uh, this was a piece of jewelry my mother had and I always wanted to see it actually swim like a fish, so I made this little contraption that could make the tail wriggle. Really rudimentary, like really just um, hands-on, you know, I didn't even have like a 3D printer, like it was just, everything was found gears and I guess you'll see how my practice kind of changed from here on. Um, this was like a digital camera made out of several different cameras, so it was all kind of, it was this Frankenstein, it was called Frank, and I just like stuck them all together and took these terrible photos, but they were interesting, you know, these like three megapixel compact flash photos. Um, and then I started moving on to like, not really computation, but working with computers. <laughs> um, and, and starting to think about automation in these works because until then everything had been kind of uh, repetitive or just mechanical. This is a uh, mechanical. Um, uh, I think that plays. Does that play? So yeah. Really simple circuits that can repeat themselves. So, um, you know, the springs are making contact, turning on the lights, um, and then this sort of switch resets the coil and it reverses. Looks randomized, but it's not. It's it's very uh, repetitive. Um, and I mean, this was early forms of computation when they were mechanical. Were like these pianola rolls or. Um, there's like a really cool reference, like Heidi Lamar was um, kind of, she was, she was an actress, but she also invented the, uh, it was like a, a code. Uh, yeah, guidance a system for torpedoes. Frequency switching system, yes. yeah, which is like a Frequency similar, hopping. Frequency hopping, yeah, yeah. Um, so, very, I kind of had to, I felt like I had to sort of, work with computers from the ground up. I'm still really interested in like using relays and <laughs> those kind of more mechanical things that just make, um, make physical uh, these digital process. I don't know why Zoom's popping up there. Can we go away? Can you go away? Just because there's a chat. There's a question. Someone has a question? Who is this? Why don't you just ask? What? I don't think he's here. No, he's okay. not here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, actuation from concept or kinetic activation? I'm not really sure I understand that question, but it's it's basically like a, a the simplest version of a, of a light switch. You know, um, there's power running through the center coil, and when it touches the springs, it connects the circuit, um, and yeah, there was lots of short circuits going on, things were getting very hot, so fortunately it would just turn them on very momentarily. Um, and this is like, yeah, exploring that idea further with another work, I guess. Um, and then still reluctant to embrace actual uh, digitization of things, I thought I could do this with light and create these, <laughs> this kind of pseudo-randomized, you know, when the, when the two coils let the beam pass through, it goes through the infrared and then you can activate an LED. I, this is just, I don't, I don't know, I had to work in this way to kind of work to where I am now. I'll just skip that. Um, this was a um, synthesizer installed on top of a volcano in, um, where was it? Uh, it was in Mount Merapi in Dr. Carter. So, um, in Indonesia. In Indonesia, yeah. At, at, at this point in my practice, I was very um, envious, I suppose, of of artists that could kind of travel and, and you know, like say, if you're a video or web-based artist, all you needed was your laptop or a or a camera, and you could work wherever. And I was like, well, I want to be able to travel and, and do all these works, and I got invited on this residency called the Instrument Builders Project, and it was the first time I kind of traveled and produced work abroad, and not the last time. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of, 
I'm, I, I feel like all artists are capable of this, but once you displace yourself, um, you get exposed to, to completely different um, cultures, not to mention just materials and, and other assets. And I think it's really important to, to be uncomfortable and like do these kind of things like and, and show yourself how resourceful you can be. Um, so, I don't know, I'll, I'll try to turn the volume up or something. It sounds awful, it's a completely analog synth, and this is built with Andrea Siagian and Pierre Van Gelder. <coughs> and uh, since it was so hot, you can see like that was the previous eruption two years before it destroyed this house, like that was the lookout. And um, it, it actually, the volcano erupted a year or two after this was installed, so it's currently stuck underneath lava. But um, the clouds uh, would change the moisture in the air and the soil, and building a really simple synthesizer, it would change the tones that, um, based on the conductivity of the soil you know, and the air, and the movement of the air with a, with a little reed switch. <sighs> Am I going too fast? This is like, I, is this, is this, is that, we good? This I guy has got another I question. Think, I think you're doing great. Can you talk, go back to the previous piece? Sure. It seems as though that, um, are you, when you do these experimentations, they seem very playful, and they seem very uh, kind of curiosity focused. Like, it isn't as though that you have this, um, this series in your mind. It seems like it's kind of problem or situation that you find of curiosity and you investigate. Is, are you, when you talk about the two artists previously, they have a body of work, and are you going kind of against a certain type of art historical tradition of creating these bodies of work, or are you just saying, whatever comes my way, I'm actually gonna have fun and really explore the um, affordances of, yeah. of this technology? No, I, I get what you're saying, and I think um, you will see there are some consistencies in my practice. There are some series that emerge, but they're kind of separated by many years or um, things like that. I, I have like a pretty large series of light-based works, which will be in, in this uh, presentation later on. Um, but I think that's one of the other things that I, I noticed when I started to study and look at Oz careers and... Um, if, if I, I mean, I studied industrial design, I started studying industrial design, and then I did not complete that degree and finished with a visual arts major. Um, and that was, that was because I didn't want uh, to become like a factory. I didn't want to be making the same thing over. And, and while you can diversify those things, I think, and I, I mean, that's one of the reasons I don't really sell work. Like you can buy it if you want to, but no one does. Um, so like I, I'm very uh, interested in like not getting bogged down into like you're the guy who makes the walking chair. Like when I made that walking chair, um, for years people were like, "You gonna make a walking table? Are you gonna make?" Like I was like, "I'm not making anything walk for like a while. <laughs> like, we're gonna hit the brakes on that and and um, explore well, some other things." Well, why I'm saying this is because it makes me happy. I look at it, and I'm, I'm assuming that that's part of the process. If you make yourself happy and there's a curiosity and a playfulness, then I'm, I'm thinking that that's what you're, I think, searching for or coming out for from the viewer. Is that part of how you see this as your process, getting feedback from the audience, or that's not even a question for you? Um. I guess to a degree, I'm like I'm, I'm really interested in the audience's experience. I think, and particularly with some of my later work, that's like a very conscious decision I take into developing work. Um, but yeah, I, I think this was also this was my brute force approach these okay. years. You know, I was just yeah. throwing everything out there and, and trying everything, and that still. Is embodied a little in my work. Like um, this, uh, this kinetic sculpture was also. I, I guess I. This, this was a disaster. Um, in short, uh, it was so many ideas compiled into one work, and I, I wanted to make this 
sculpture that could do everything and interact with everything and move in, in these kind of mechanical ways. I, I cast the aluminium not the right way to produce this material. It was a really interesting sculpture. I actually just, I think like two years ago, threw this out at the junkyard because uh, <laughs> it was just sitting there and it was never going to even do this again. So, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. Sometimes you you have these ideas and concepts and a work that you really want to explore, um, and it doesn't quite work. But the the kind of research and, and and experience of developing that can lend itself to other works. And I feel like this work is embodied in so many later works that I did that were more successful, compartmentalizing the ideas that I threw into this. I'm not even going to get into it, but. How yeah. did you call it? That was called Venus, of course. Venus. Yeah, like a Venus flytrap. Mm -hmm. It was meant to uh, basically be like a laser harp, so it would open and, and shine these laser beams across, and then uh, the laser beams were ultraviolet, and I wanted to attract moths, and then like get the insects to kind of play this instrument. And I was like, why? Why am I trying to do that? Like, what for? Um, this is something you should never do at home. something you should never do. circumstance that allowed me to do it and you shouldn't you shouldn't do this there's, there's bad mercury vapor and stuff inside those tubes but um, the, the work itself was activated by a cell phone and so my theory was like putting the audience's responsibility on activating the work I was just putting it in the space it's kind of like the goldfish in the blender you know like are you going to turn it on like that's up to you um, and the technology of like using it, it essentially used the cell phone's light to activate a relay, which is like a super common way of detonating IEDs and roadside explosives. Um, it's not necessarily anything complex, but like with a couple of little transistors and stuff, you can essentially turn any cell phone into like a worldwide range remote detonation device, and so. Not the last time I used this system either. Um, so um, now we're moving to my first, I guess, major light work. And so coming back after like experimenting with um, you know dangerous things or, or sort of more politically engaged work, and I definitely come back to way more politically engaged work in my practice. Um, I wanted to build this um, kinetic sculpture, Big Dipper, and I was on residency in uh, Fort Kochi in India and decided that would be the best place to build this thing for some reason. So I um, designed the CAD model, cut all the plywood, um, the jigsaw, um, and that's Big Dipper. It's been rebuilt several times since it's quite simple, like CNC cut plywood. Um, I think there's, there's been four built and one decommissioned. The India one is decommissioned. There's one currently on display in uh, Bali in Indonesia and one in, two in Poland and one of them's going on display soon. Um, and then I just thought I would completely skip explaining but the slide over there is kind of the continuation of this large-scale light series, which was called Cryptid. Um, now, Cryptid was essentially Big Dipper's um, sort of uh, the follow it Like, in that series of work, Cryptid is the next work. And what I wanted to do was, basically, Big Dipper always needs to be suspended, and the illusion of it hovering um, is always kind of 
fake. So I wanted to make a work where the lights themselves moved across the room and I ended up building uh, 18 degrees of freedom giant hexapod to do that. There's other ways to do that and, <laughs> and I explore those too. But um, uh, yeah, again, as with most of these works, um, particularly the ones I'm showing you because I'm showing you things that actually work, uh, I'm very interested in not just doing things physically but doing them for real um, and not speculating that like, you know, this sculpture could or this, this could be hovering, this could be walking, but they, they kind of do those things. Um, any, is it, we're good, I'll just keep going. Um, so this is an interesting work, uh, and like I said, uh, so that wouldn't be the last time I did cell phone activated sculptures. This won't be the last time you see CCTV cameras in this slideshow either. Um, I built these really rudimentary, like using just hot glue and um, you know what, like balsa wood, whatever I could really find. Um, basically, slide projectors and they would be activated by a cell phone. I worked with a, another collective on like actually installing and building this work, but, well, I built everything in it. Anyway, um, and they would project these anti-G20 slogans. So the G20 summit came to Brisbane, Australia, um, and there was this extreme policing around the city where um, you couldn't even uh, buy a carton of eggs because they feared you would be egging politicians. So to allow people to protest inside the, the zone, I worked with a graphic design firm who designed these slides that went inside these projectors and then we installed them through the city and the idea was to hand out the cell phone numbers to allow people to call in and actively protest by activating slides. But evening, this is what happened. And sees two fake security cameras within the G20 lockdown zone as they scour the area ahead of the World Leaders Summit. They're believed to have been planted by protesters. Live down to Max Futcher outside the convention centre. And Max, what more can you tell us about this security breach near the venue? Well, Sharon, some protesters have clearly uh, planned well in advance to try and get their message across. Several days ago, police discovered two devices capable of projecting anti-G20 slogans onto the side of the venue. One of them was uh, made to look like a CCTV, CCTV camera. Both of them were created to be activated by a mobile phone. This has been widely reported as a security breach, but officers we've spoken to say that uh, the devices were put in place before the venue was locked down and were discovered by police who were looking for something just like this. They are now reviewing real CCTV footage, hoping to find the culprit. <laughs> Days before World Leaders arrived, police have stumbled across a well-planned campaign to convey an anti-G20 message during the event. Fake cameras planted in the restricted zone around the convention centre designed to project anti-G20 slogans onto flat surfaces and triggered remotely by a mobile phone. Police say they'll examine CCTV surveillance from surrounding buildings in an attempt to identify those responsible. It comes as international security teams begin arriving at Brisbane to protect leaders during the summit. This morning, a Russian cargo plane landed carrying private motorcade vehicles for President Vladimir Putin's delegation. And the physical signs of security are... So, um, I mean, um, my OPSEC is not that good. I do not think they were looking for us at all. Uh, so, what's the chat? Alejandro. When signing, do you start with the outcome? Well, let's just hang out after this. Uh, Alejandro? We can, Alejandro, we can, we can uh, have the discussion later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there'll be a discussion. Uh, yeah, so like maybe, yeah, interject if something's pressing, but also let's, um, there's a lot of slides here. That I, so did they ever uh, find out no. who you guys were? No. I, I, I'm probably just on some kind of watch list, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, I left town and apparently some not police turned up at the door when, at my old house, uh, but I didn't hear anything else. That was, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, 
Are you sure it was you, or is there some deniability here? Could it have been your twin yeah. brother? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it was your twin brother. Everyone, I've, I'm very inconspicuous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, this is going to be some interactive work, and, and I... It feels really weird dividing my practice up because, like you said, it's like are these series, and, and maybe I should be putting these slides through the years, compacted into different series of different things I looked into. But um, it all kind of just cascades, and so that's kind of a little bit embodied uh, here. Um, this was a uh, interesting installation. I got invited uh, to an illegal mining town in the Amazon in Peru, and. Um, I designed this completely over-engineered uh, kinetic sculpture to silhouette this giant statue of a miner, uh, like a gold panning miner, that's this giant gold pan. Um, so the whole town was like on deforested uh, at the Amazon basin, and like the things they had done to the riverbed were atrocious, but um, the town was funded by like the gold panning and, and, and miners, but um, we had to be very, like, uh, there was a group of artists, there's this really interesting residency program called Hawapi, and um, they, I mean, the year after this, they went to an active minefield, um, you know, they just go to really extreme places in South America and drag artists there, and um, this was one I did. And so I wanted to build this sculpture that um, kind of silhouetted this grotesquely masculine gold panning miner with these lamps and, and kind of make it angelic uh, because we weren't really allowed to have any political commentary in this town. These wings uh, kinetically like rise and fall uh, and the lamps themselves are mercury vapor lamps which is one of the main pollutants of the mining process in that town. And so effectively like while to the locals, it kind of looked like, you know, whatever, we're turning this statue into an angel. But um, the rising and falling of mercury vapor is kind of, yeah, the main pollutant. And so um, this is a really great snippet from like the local TV station. I don't know what's happening inside there, but um, again, there was like nowhere to work, so I had to like assemble this on my bed frame. Uh, in a hotel there, and there were large areas of the town we weren't allowed to walk through because we probably wouldn't be coming back. Uh, so it was the most like Wild West situation I've ever been in, but anyway, this was uh, heavy metals of work from I think like 2015. Um, and so that kind of might be the first reference for like responding to working with infrastructure uh, and statues, I suppose, but later on there's more uh, infrastructure related things. And so in 2016 I was in Paris and I had this idea to build um, build an installation. Um, so I, I was actually there for a, an alternative, for an art exhibition, um, but it was, was this 2016? It was the Neut de Boue protests, which was just following the um, 2015 Paris attacks, which caused France to get involved with the war in Syria. So I built a little, um, these two syringes, which would activate every time there was a bombing detected in Syria, and installed it uh, atop this statue to, to bring the tears back to Paris. So this work was called Digital Empathy Device. Um, completely constructed in my hotel room, and there was I, I got tear gassed shortly after that. <laughs> but uh, that's a uh, there was a still from live map. But um, here you can see it was like a really high contrast day, unfortunately, when the first tears came. But that's the tears coming out of the statue. Um, there was a protest going on, which provided kind of perfect cover to actually get up there and, and install this work, but. Um, yeah, that's that's digital empathy device. Wow, this is really a roller coaster of work. Uh, <laughs> um, this is synthetic colonizer. Um, it essentially is like a, a mechatronic uh, canola flower or rapeseed, 
and um, it extrudes a synthetic nectar uh, and real pollen. And so the synthetic nectar is used to attract bees um, and then with the hope of pollinating them. Uh, so this kind of went a little bit wild online and a lot of people thought I was trying to save the bees or something like that, but I think the whole um, narrative behind this work is, is just kind of intervening in a natural process with technology and that's kind of the commentary I wanted to make. And I, I, there's a later work that does this more succinctly, which um, I'll get to, but I managed to get this really cool shot of a bee accidentally walking away with a piece of pollen. Um, yeah, I feel like there's got to be some burning questions just right now, but we could keep going. We're good? I uh, just wanted to ask you, why were you so uh, passionate about imposing yourself in a political act? Why was that uh, a motivational force for your art making? Um, I think it's something that becomes more and more relevant uh, to the work I consider making, and, and I think, I mean, I think a lot about this meat robot that I inhabit, you know? And I think, like, as, as soon as people, I mean, that ex even that experience in the mining town where, you know, the value of life was just nothing. Like it was, it, there was child labor, it was just like kind of, it was an awful place to be. Um, but people were still happy, but like, I, I don't know, like wars and, and, and now um, I think even digital sovereignty are something that I, I think is just really robbing people of the experience of, of their life, you know, like why? <clears throat> And, and similar with natural systems as well. And I, I think it's something that, uh, as you work with technology and understand it, and, uh, excuse me, no phones. <laughs> um, Intervention. I, yeah, yeah. The Zoom thing keeps popping up. Can I, can I minimize? Is it true that your first political intervention was in Brisbane? Probably, yeah, most likely. Where yeah. Where you come from? Um, I was born in South Africa, oh, actually. Sorry, yeah. but that's where you were living. That's where, I, yeah, I went to university. <clears throat> and then you start going on these residencies. Yep. And then that's where you get into the logic of site specificity, which involves always yep. some kind of engagement with yep. local conditions. And yep. Political suddenly becomes visible and, and unavoidable. Yeah. So it seems that you became, uh, you know, traveling site specific in, into interventions. Oh, wow. Okay. Totally, yeah. And I, I think for me, <laughs> it's, it's something that um, was actually like, uh, particularly like with this work and, and um, even the one in, in uh, Web Petwe in the Amazon, I was really. Um, I mean, I was an outsider and I was coming in with a lot of privilege, my world experiences, and I'm just diving into another culture. And um, It was something that I kind of had a problem with initially where I, I was thinking, like, it's not my place to have these discussions. But, um, I mean, I'm sort of at a point now where if you ask me where I'm from, I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> like, I've been living out of a suitcase for well over a year. And um, I kind of think that we're more connected than ever, and these are world issues. And, and I think the human condition is something that just needs to needs to be valued. Um, and if I'm in any way imparting that process, then I have to do it. You know. Um, but yes, it, it can be problematic. But I, I feel well equipped morally to have those discussions, and I'm definitely kind of wanting those discussions, I think, because I think that's another catalyst to leading to, to further interest and, and, you know, people actually engaging. Um, so, I mean, it's really funny to go from, like, you know, war and, and, like, just 
it, it's a funny world we live in, and I think like if I was completely serious and and, and completely, um, uh, you know, uh, I think humor is a way to access uh, a lot of empathy and engagement, and and even some of the more serious works have a little sprinkle of that. I do hope. Um, and so this work was, uh, this is actually still kind of a proposal, but it was called Selfless Driving Car. And I put together this manual uh, over an old Honda City manual, uh, describing a project that I wanted to do that referenced Lauren Carpenter's 1991 uh, graphical interface experiment, which is made famous by Adam Curtis' Machines of Loving Grace documentary, which is just brilliant if you haven't seen it. Um, and so essentially in Lauren's experiment, there's a, a room full of people with rackets and they black, what, the red and white or something like that, and the room's divided and on a projector at the end of the room, and this is 1991, remember, uh, they put a game of Pong and quantitatively people's rackets would be yes and no for the placement of the, the Pong bracket and collectively without any guidance, the room was able to like self-govern this game of Pong. And this born, this birthed a lot of kind of utopian ideas for the internet, like that it would be a free and democratic space where people can, you know, self-govern and, and be their own sovereign entity. Uh, and of course that's not what happened. But um, with selfless driving car, I wanted to get a full-sized vehicle, get inside it, and then outsource the position of my steering wheel to a voting system. Um, so maintaining control of the accelerator, this is um, a view from the app developed for the scale test of this project. Um, and so you could press either side of the screen or slide the slider and everyone's vote would like sort of guide uh, a percentage-based position for the steering wheel. And this actually worked a lot better than I expected. So I had a small captive audience that funded the development of this work uh, in Gold Coast, Australia. Um, and we completed a few loops of this. This It wasn't really a racetrack, it was an outdoor amphitheater, but it kind of had this paved oval. Um, so yeah, I think this work as well uh, contains like I feel like this scale test is, is selling it short because uh, another kind of ethical thing this work is trying to present is, is that digital actions have more physical consequences than ever and I wanted to put me inside the vehicle so there's this like um, sense of responsibility to actually like do we crash the vehicle with you inside it or do we like try and help you complete this race course. Um, so, still really want to do that actually, but um, no one seems to let me do my suicide proposals for some reason. <laughs> that, that, that particular project really lends itself to research and, uh, and uh, what we call user studies and so on. You could really study you know, behavioral patterns and, you know, there's a lot to be said about it, right? Definitely, and I think... And, there's, and it's in line with a lot of work that, had, that is being done yeah. in that domain anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, like, you know, um, historically as well, like, there's, it was, is it Ant Farm Collective that did Media Burn, where they drive the car through a bunch of TVs, and, like, there's a lot of art history that, you know, references motor vehicles as well and I'm interested in making like a, a weird footnote to the history of like interactive media and you know online responsibility with a work like that um, and I'd like to do it at, at an extremely public event like a pre-event for the NASCAR or something you know like on the oval track so that no one but myself would get injured and anyway there's, there's a lot to making something like that real um, Maybe if it was the 70s, I'd just be able to go do it, which would be great, but... <laughs> um, yeah, we can not worry about that and skip to the second version. Uh, this is another light sculpture I made, and this was built during COVID. And so, um, the work's called Azimuth. It has 12 
UVC lamps, so they emit a wavelength of UV. They're, they're essentially normal fluorescent tubes, but they have this borosilic glass that lets this wavelength of light pass through. Um, fortunately, our atmosphere stops UVC from hitting the surface, but it's an extremely uh, kind of dangerous wavelength of light. It, it kills all organic material and is often used in HVAC systems and like sterilizing things. So I built this sculpture that had to kind of withstand its own light um, without breaking down. So I had to use a lot of very UV stable plastics and reference satellite design for like existing in these kind of harsh environments. And the work itself had to be viewed behind a welding curtain uh, so that you wouldn't be exposed to this, this harsh light. Uh, it emitted this crazy smell as well, like it, it supposedly wasn't ozone, I got it tested, but it smelled like ozone. Um, and it uses a reaction wheel to, to move itself, again, much like a satellite. Um, it has 12 lamps because it was designed to be like a timepiece and tick between the lamps every second. But every second is kind of fast and it would essentially just be rolling, so I dialed back a bit. Um, uh, yeah, so essentially it while making the space entirely safe during a COVID era, you were also unable to access the space. Um, this again is another work that happened during COVID. This is called Steal the Sunshine. Uh, and while everyone was indoors and doing things on computers, I thought, why not bring the sun indoors? And I, I built this. It's essentially uh, an LED display of 108 really large pixels that recreates the rise and fall of the sun. Um, initial concept was to use a, a camera and actually get a very low resolution image of the sun and then vector it to these pixels. Uh, this is a, a, a sped up display, so this would be like sunrise till midday, midday is the entire grid, and then it would shrink back down to this little ball at the center. Um, this work and actually the one of Azimuth walking through the gallery space is like another problem I encounter. So this had to be dimmed down to about 15% of its actual brightness because it was starting to damage print works and other works in the space. <laughs> so um, yeah, making really bright things can actually be problematic. Why did I exit that? I'm sorry. Is there a way to start from that slide? I do not know. Uh, while I find that slide, is there any questions? <laughs> I, I want to build on, um, I think, uh, Big Heptage's uh, observations. Are you, it sounds as though that you are going into these sites. So you're the kind of the, the artist coming into this site, site specificity, and you're enacting a certain type of, I think, performative machinery slash commentary. Um, but when it comes to the destruction part, I think that's another layer of responsibility, and it sounds as though that you're giving us a, kind of a record, like uh, as a reporter or, or as like a scientist, you're telling us now, these machines that I make that are kind of playful can also be destructive. And I think the Marco commented about the car. I was curious, was there any uh, loss of life, like killing of insects, or, you know what I mean? Because then that's also a moral dilemma, that that piece can be um, So can you comment about the, the, I think the playfulness, but now also your responsibility as an artist to, to curb or understand the destructive power of some of what you're doing? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's why I wanted to throw myself in the vehicle, you know, like, um, it's my message, why, why am I not the, the victim of that experience? Um, and I, I think, 
Ja. Well, yeah. I don't know, I think we can come back to that question when we've looked at a few other works as well. Yeah. Dick? Yeah. In what way am I a Luddite? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Luddites were you know, weavers about to be de skilled to run around with sledgehammers. Yep. So, yep. it's toy machine. Yep. It, it, I, you know, I just wonder if you want to find a different term for what we're doing, so it may be softer than we're up for, and it's kind of there's a simplicity and a critique at the same time, and there's an absurdist. Yeah. And that's why I think Luddite is the perfect term. Because, like, um, while it might seem like I'm enamored with technology, I mean, growing up, I was obsessed with robotics and all these kind of things. And then, as I started to understand these systems better, I felt kind of betrayed. And, and I think, like, um, to, to say, like, I don't like techno I don't like technology, I don't trust it, but then never actually use it and understand it uh, would, would be like a farce, you know, like I, I think and it, it creates this constant dichotomy where there's emerging technology to respond to and I have to understand it. But if there was a solar flare tomorrow I would be more than happy. Like <laughs> I just think um, I like I, I of course love technology and I do value a lot of the, the sort of conveniences and, and, you know, people are living longer and better than ever, but I do think there's certain ways that capitalist society is running that enables bad actors to kind of have very uh, big um, social effects on people, um, not, not just environmental, uh, and I think that responsibility is constantly ignored. So, yeah. One other question about, which, going back to the science, but it's in the political you know, the politics. It's, it's a very spongy term. The, uh, the thing you did in, in you know, Gold Miner Angel, yep. which is again pretty big. Yeah. Inspiration. Yeah. Well, How could you communicate that to, to minds Well, that's the thing. We we couldn't in that environment because we probably wouldn't be leaving the town. Like it was, you know, uh, it was really wild west. So to like come there because environmentalists had been through the town. So to actually even let artists in was like a challenge because it's really bad what they're doing to the Amazon. So to go there and then have commentary on, on anything that was like against their way of life was just a no-go. So it's it was... Literally physically dangerous. Though. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Really is. Yeah. And, you know, on the edge of heart darkness. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, These are tiny pictures for you, but um, the, uh, this is a work um, which is currently on display in Ljubljana. Uh, so I built, and, and again, a, a lot of these works I should mention, like particularly moving into works that use a lot of computation and code, I do work with people. Um, I still maintain complete control of like pretty much all the design, fabrication, I sometimes have assistance when I have the budget for it, but it's worth mentioning that I do work with programmers. Um, but I'm usually quite interested in like finding all the libraries and resources and making sure that all these things can fit together and uh, the project is possible before even starting it. Uh, so this uh, is called Persistence of Vision. Um, this is some shots from the Slovenian install, but um, a great drone video here. Of, uh, so this was on display in 
Melbourne, Victoria for over a year, and it's this network of AI-enabled cameras that are actually like spotlights that track you through this laneway. Each one has a Jetson Nano, yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah, Jetson Nano, running the DeepStream uh, vision library to like track you and send to you in the frame. And the Melbourne installation of the work was actually networked, so you can see how the next camera is kind of looking for me and, and spotting me. Um, they were completely custom made uh, using brushless servo motors and like extremely over the top complex, but it's the reason it ran for a year. So, um, yeah. Again, this was quite, uh, I was like, am I going to make this laneway a hostile space or, you know, um, completely change this environment? But as I went there through the the year of installation, there was still, you know, vomit and whatever else, new graffiti, like it was still the same kind of uh, unsafe space it always was, which is kind of interesting. Um, this was uh, one of my last major works, uh, Celestial Bed, and it's kind of a version of Synthetic Pollinizer, except it's for humans. And so this is a mechanic, like a mechatronic orchid that can achieve human pollination. So it can extract and deliver semen, basically um, intervening in the natural reproductive cycle. It, it is a, not essentially an, an IVF machine, it's very rudimentary and mechanical, but um, it is, uh, it's a whole lot. <laughs> and um, I suppose with Celestial Bed, um, I, I should probably explain more about this work. I feel like I can't just like... <laughs> just, um, Celestial Bed was the name given to... Uh, there was this guy, James Graham, in the 1700s, who was a self-proclaimed sexologist, and he ran the Temple of Hymen in the Adelphi Plaza in London, which was essentially kind of like a brothel, but also like he had a lot of pseudoscience things going on where um, you could buy celestial ether and like sniff these different scents that were meant to increase your libido. But one of the items he had was called Celestial Bed, and it was uh, this kind of vibrating bed that could do all these crazy things that were meant to increase your chances of conception. So you could rent it for 50 pounds for the night with your lover, and um, hopefully actually conceive, which is crazy. Um, but riffing on that like kind of romantic idea of, of the celestial bed, um, and then kind of creating this really cold looking and sci-fi uh, mechanical sex machine. Um, I want, basically with this work, I, I wanted to, I'd been making interactive works and kind of proposing things and, you know, put, putting things in between uh, natural or social processes, but then I thought, like, what is the kind of the punchline of, like, human interaction and there's, there's not much more than, you know, sex or death and so I thought, why not intervene in that natural process? And the work itself is also capable of, like, you know, enabling queer or trans couples with a surrogate to conceive. Um, there's a lot of things this work could do uh, that do not sit within the legal framework, but it is completely capable of these processes. Um, when the work was actually commissioned, it was, uh, we had to sign a contract that any life forms born through use of this sculpture were liable to sue the artists and not the funding body, which is kind of hilarious. Um, so, yeah, that's some production images, and it's like a short video clip of, of how it moved and some of the mechanisms behind it. As with a lot of this stuff, I have everything on this computer, so like, if you want to hang around after, or like, I don't know if I'm going over time or what, but um, yeah, I can, I can show stuff. Uh, about how these projects happen, why, or even just process photos. So 
maybe we should try to get through the rest of these slides and then you know, we can move on to that. So just jumping quickly into video work, this is a still from Ether Antenna. Uh, this was uh, this. so I did a residency in Nepal with the Robotics Association of Nepal. Uh, yeah, that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> they really into robotics up there, and. Um, I built these little characters to play out a Buddhist narrative um, and they were all built in situ during that residency. Uh, the idea itself came from, I, I had been to Ladakh, which is the India side of the Himalayas, it's also uh, very Buddhist and they have these prayer wheels that um, you can kind of spin with your hand or they're automated by water or they're automated by fire or wind and it's just like this idea of like these inscribed drums that actually have um, you know that's that's the solar powered prayer wheel that you'd see on the dash of every taxi cab in Kathmandu and the idea of like automating your prayers like just like outsourcing it to get technology to do it for you was like such an attractive concept to me so yeah that's why I decided to automate this this um, narrative of a bodhisattva uh, and play it out with these robotic characters. Uh, jumping again, this is uh, that is Little Sunfish, which is a specially designed ROV that was sent into Fukushima Daiichi Reactor Number Three, which was completely flooded. Um, so this little submarine critter was the first thing that was able to see the, the molten PCB in the center of the reactor. And it was a, a very successful mission, a lot of great publicity. Um, and I thought like, it, it, it was really interesting and very Japanese of them to like, make it a caricature, call it Little Sunfish, and you know, it was this adorable submarine. So I did a video work where I recreated exactly that submarine uh, at about a third of the scale, so the original is 40 centimeters, I think mine is about eight. Uh, and this was to make it fit in submersible sets uh, that I could fit inside a large fish tank because I also rebuilt the interior of the reactor uh, to scale. So this is a fully functioning model submarine, completely uh, 3D printed. Um, I had to figure out a lot of waterproofing, a lot of like fitting everything inside, uh, and the, yeah, essentially the same thing, just a lot smaller. Um, I used a lot of images of the original Little Sunfish and then like traced them uh, at scale and created my own models. Um, this is some of the testing because the thrust mechanism was really interesting and had this like quad thrust thing happening. So I wanted to make sure I could make a device that could, I could actually control underwater with this like quad thrust setup. Um, so I was experimenting with drone controllers and um, different kinds of stabilizers. In the end, the most successful control method was infrared. Um, and this is the little infrared model tests. So to make it a little more animated, not just watching a submarine, I added these kind of eyelids to the camera module to give it a little bit more emotion as it like kind of traversed these scenes. Um, this is some of the production photos. So there was like multiple models built for different scenes, scenarios. I storyboarded everything, um, uh, and then kind of went around and. The narrative of the film is, is so one of the, the major problems with Fukushima Daiichi is the contaminated water. Uh, and they've just been, they've filtered it except all the tritium particles are like really hard to get out. Um, and so they've been storing like millions of 
tons of water at this site, and they only started releasing it a month ago. Um, but yeah, it got eaten by a cuttlefish at one point too. Uh, this is people doing the work, but this is this is footage from uh, Fukushima last month, uh, actually a month ago, uh, where they started re-releasing the water back into the ocean. I, long story short, like it, dilution is the solution. I don't think it is the environmental disaster that it could have been, but um, the film itself, Little Sunfish becomes infected with radiation and escapes the reactor, spreading ra radiation out into the ocean. So essentially, that's happened now. Um, I'll just breathe through these last ones really quick because I'm way over time, but I recently uh, just finished my Masters of Fine Arts in Cr at Cranbrook College of Arts in Detroit. It's a really cute little art school. Um, and when I went there, I did the first thing uh, all students should do and make pipe bombs. Um, these are not pipe bombs, but they, they're made to look like pipe bombs. And so inside each one of these vessels is a, um, a sample of uh, trinitite, which is glass formed from the first from the Trinity test when they detonated the first nuclear bomb. It turned the desert sand to glass and people went around and collected this and you can buy samples of it. And so there's this tiny radioactive sample of glass encased in this tube with a, a 4K video camera that essentially films the sample constantly and outputs it as a live feed. So there's the 3D printed enclosure and then it's wrapped in lead as an effort to seal the radiation. It is really minute radiation, but um, there's definitely none getting out now that it's encased in a lead pipe bomb. Uh, and the work was called Dirty Bomb. And kind of the interesting thing about like even researching little sunfish, you can see um, the imaging sensor getting damaged by radiation. It's a really common thing in satellites, like radiation damages in imaging sensors. So. I wanted to create a durational video work that would theoretically, the image would decompose over many years uh, because it's encased in this radioactive chamber. Um, I did a couple of experiments uh, that I've been calling anomalies, where I try and use technology to do things that, um, you know, are at the fringe of kind of a little bit of a, like a UFO or what is that kind of moment. So I punched up hole in an ice lake and built this um, essentially floating uh, thrust vehicle that would drive underneath the surface of the ice, so it floated up against it and I could steer this flashlight around, um, which is, it, it looked, the drone footage doesn't really work, like actually seeing it at ground level in person was, was quite strange. Um, and again, this would only work for like a minute or two before the batteries froze over because the water was so cold. Um, and then another anomaly kind of experiment, I've been working with a drone and a laser excited phosphor LED uh, to try and create this, this kind of ra rising beam of light. So, kind of like the UFO beam, but um, I really want to you kind of need the right conditions, you need like mist and the beam disappears really quickly but I'm really interested in creating this sort of beam that just rises slowly from the ground and is an anomalous effect. Um, this was a, a quick intervention I did in Detroit, there was an abandoned radio station um, and uh, I explored the site and took this photo of these plastic flowers that were just sitting there and there's a library and I mean Detroit uh, is full of abandoned buildings and responding to infrastructure again I took that photo and turned it into a slow scan TV uh, uh, audio sample and then installed a transmitter at that location and broadcast again so effectively reactivating the radio station um, and then walking away and recording the downloaded image as it faded with distance um, and then that was a series of prints um, yeah, so generating work by responding to sight. Um, these are big light sculptures. We can just skip that. Um, yeah, I think I'm well over time, so... Uh
Thanks, everyone. And if you need to go somewhere, do that. But if you want to stick around and ask questions, we can, we can do that. It was like it was referential to that medium, and then you know, going deeper and basically finding stuff online. Because yeah, being in Australia, there is there is like a new media art scene, but like Europe is kind of where it all happens. And starting to see what people were doing, and then realizing that is valid and a way to work. Like that was yeah. Um, you gotta look out outside <laughs> outside of Australia, definitely. But. There is, there's a lot of great stuff happening in Australia, I think. Yeah. I'm wondering if you ever saw a movie called The Cars That Ate Paris? No. It's an Australian movie it's from 1974. Wow. It's about a town called Paris in Australia, huh. where, the, where the people of the town have a kind of love-hate relationship to their cars. And they begin to modify them and create mayhem. And it's really like where Mad Max came from. It's like the, the precursor to Mad Max and all of that. Wow. And, uh, and there's a bit of that also with Tom Lee. And not so much Theo Jansen. Yeah, Theo Jansen is more of a computation, yeah. you know, computational approach to sculpture. It's, yeah, right. It's still mechanical, it's always. It is, yeah, but he, he, it was basically artificial life, right? I mean, that's where he comes from, you know. But mechanical. He's yeah. determined to keep things analog, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, but he designed them with a computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was in a, in a meeting and I was trying to get over here and I was uh, watching on the phone. I was on the Zoom and trying to get over. And as I got to the building, you were saying that you had a background in industrial design, but then you gave it up. One year. You, you changed. One year of study, in yeah. One of my many lives I taught industrial design, so I'm curious about that particular statement. What, I didn't hear what you what you did. I heard that you were you were in it, and then for some reason you changed. But I didn't hear the reason. Well, it, it, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to be making products, basically, um, and I wanted to be able to like really keep exploring without this this kind. Like there was this at least at that time there was like a modality to just like focus on you know is this a producible item? Like is this something you can make? Like so at, and that's my answer to like why my practice is so wishy-washy and diverse is because I didn't want to get stuck into just being the guy who does that thing. 
I, I understand that. I, my own background, uh, before I mutated many times over, was architecture. And architecture has a kind of critical component. Uh, and then I, then I was invited to teach in a department of industrial design, and I thought it would be the same, because uh, it was another design discipline. And it turned out that the industrial designers were very good at making things, but they were completely uncritical. Because you know, they were basically making consumer goods, and if it was consumable, yeah. it was good. Yeah. And there was no critical position. It was that's what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's interesting that you you encountered that. Definitely. Yeah. And decided not not to do that. Well, that was like 2010, and I I do hope it's changed as well. You know, like um, because it, you would think it would have to with open source uh, being such a big part of kind of the ethics of things these days. So. so so the question that that brings up for me, I mean, and of course, thank you for your presentation, and especially for the large variety of things, you know, the sort of constant productivity of, of it all, which is impressive. Um, the, the thing in, in that discussion with criticality versus this consumerism, the thing that the industrial designers had was scale. Mm -hmm. You know, they would design something and there would be millions of them in the world that would just kind of be put out there. Yeah. And the other side of the, of the scale was that everything was ephemeral. Like even, I mean, certainly the graphic design just vanished as soon as it was posted. But even cars are ephemeral, you know. And, and even a, a really good car has to be replaced by a new one, which may not be as good, but it has to be a new one. Yeah. Okay. Then you say, okay, I'm not, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I see the vanity of it all. Fine. But then the question arises, well, what about scale? Or how do you reach... How do I reach people? Yeah. People, because you can reach us. Yeah. You can reach, you know, the, the three people in that town yeah. in the wild, wild west and have been to places like that. It's yeah. very dangerous. Um, but then no one knows, right? For sure, yeah. Um, uh, I think so. I mean, I should should have mentioned, but that's that's kind of the reason I started making those video works was because, um, particularly at this stage, I don't even have like the budget or like resources to develop work that can last forever. All these like if you're making physical things, they wear out. Like things don't last forever, and a lot of art museums and stuff still don't really understand that, <laughs> and they think, oh, it's not working today, and it's like, well, of course, like it's worn out. But um, I, with the video works, I could create very ad hoc and like scrappy things and then capture them as video and then the video could live longer than the sculptures had to, which is really a rewarding process. Um, but um, I, I think my answer to your question is like, what, what do people get to take home? Because I'm building these big, weird sculptures or uh, interactive installations and I, I like to think uh, that I'm trying to give people experiences because that is something they can keep. Um, and so creating environments where people may experience something, where they engage with the work, uh, whether it's fear, humor, laughter, and orgasm, I don't know, you know, it depends. But um, yeah, I, I think that's something I'm trying to be more conscious of because I, I want people to be able to keep something about my practice. A few people managed to escape that, and so Tang Li was mentioned, and I've been to the museum at Basel, and it's really pretty amazing. It is, yeah. Uh, and somehow, I mean, somehow they're keeping these things working, and people... But that's yeah. against his ethics as well. I mean, if you yeah. read he's like the chaos of the things, they have a lifespan, they die, and now people are keeping them alive because they're worth a lot of money, which is, is, is really funny, but... Um, uh, yeah, like, you know, the famous well, homage to New York when he built that giant float. Uh, he, he, built, he built this, like, giant sculpture that was, like, several stories tall and it was on a float on residency in New York. Um, and the whole thing, like, burnt down before anyone could even see it. And there's just pictures of it burning, like, before it could even drive well, around. It was designed to self-destruct. I know, but I think it happened before it was meant to. And it's just embraced. He's just like, this is it. Like it, it you know, um, which is cool. But also, you know, if people come all the way, 
drive 30 minutes to the gallery to see your kinetic sculpture and it's busted. That kind of sucks. Like you, you, you know, you want to be sure. I, I think it's important to value your audience, basically, in short. Well, what I was getting at was that somehow people, people get through. Like, yeah, I, I think you have to value your audience and things will happen and this and that and the other. But somehow, a few people manage to get through and then you, you get the other phenomenon which you have, let's say, the Tate and, you know, in London and the Turbine Hall. And somehow this great big organization says, here, do something here. And now it's a vast place. Mm -hmm. And so this is more like, you don't have to answer this, it's an impossible question, but it's a fun thought experiment. So if you were to take this, you know, which you've so far explored in small things that you've been able to make more or less mm -hmm. by yourself, and you've, you've given the opportunity to do something for, for the Tate, you know, in the Turbine Hall. Well, like an endless budget, dream project. Yeah, no, no, budget isn't the issue, and the thing is vast. You know, the yeah. only thing is that, you know, you're given a deadline, like, in, in a year or two uh -huh. years or something like that, and knock yourself out. But then, hundreds of thousands of people are going to see it. Yeah, well, that's, that's it. It's like, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that project would be, but, like, it would be trying to create a, you know, a collective experience, you know, like something that... Like all the force, big sun. Like the big, kind of yeah, thing. like the big sun. That was a good reference. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but I, I think like as well like a lot of these works like basically just drag you through it, just drag you through the mud, and talk to you about exactly what they're doing uh, and a tiny amount of why. And I do think like if you're creating, this is my ethics, so to whatever, but like if you'll see on my website all my work statements are really short because if I have to spend time explaining every detail of it then the experience is lost. I think the work needs to speak for itself and it needs to be engaging and that's again like coming back to respecting and valuing your audience, you know, because uh, some, sometimes, you know, you might have something really, like a really terrible thing that you want to share with people but if it's not Engaging, they're not going to even engage. It's not like backstories. It's so complicated. Yeah. I mean, you, you yes. Really profound investigation. Yeah, we'd be here for a really long time. The last word. Yeah. So it's very difficult to get the haiku kind of Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Background thinking. Maybe I should just show like three works next time. <laughs> Be like, these ones. It's really great. It's great and it's raining work. I was interested in the first work we showed, you figure in it. The chair? Yeah. yeah. You're an actor in it. Yep. You're in that kind of bus of heat and the chair and the hair coming down. Yep. You know, you were a performance artist at that point. And the only other time we well, I think like if I'm creating things that um, could be uh, dangerous or something like that, I I've already exposed audiences to that before. But I think I'd like to not do that <laughs> in future. And I think like if it if it is. You know, if I can be the victim of my own uh, installation, that's the way I'd like to do it. I don't know why it's not playing now. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that just kind of makes sense. And oh, I mean, this thing—it did not by design, but at at that stage, it kind of did electrocute you through the handles. So like driving. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've since put like better motor controllers, but this was just analog switches with 24 volts running through your hands, so, yeah. But what, what about this performative aspect of your work? Have you consciously abandoned it, or it's just, it was, it's just part of the, the flow, that somehow it's... I mean, I can show you... now. I, if I showed you the... The full documentation for Celestial Head, I'd probably have a Title Nine, you know, like. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, it's very important that I yeah do test these things and make sure they work. But um, yeah. 
Uh, that was my follow-up question. With uh, it sounds as though when you talked, to, I, I'm, I'm riffing off of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Dick's um, observations. It seems like you're uh, kind of uh, erasing yourself from the work, but you're also you made a comment that you you were kind of like I'm not sure a meat puppet or some sort of you know meat uh, machine or something. Meat mac. Yeah, yeah and, and that kind of caught me um, that kind of caught me a little by surprise. But my question would be, how do you look at the history of abject art or or um, or the understanding of like humanity with cybernetics or robotics kind of melding into each other? Because um, when I look at some of your work, then I'm going, wow, there's anime there, there's sci-fi there, and there's yes. all these, you know, these little um, beautiful gems that you could locate it. Mm -hmm. How important is it for you to think about this, you know, melding with the computer and in a way to signal? It seems like signal and information is what you're going toward next. Well, I think like, you know, like Stellark is a perfect example like of, of man-machine kind of artist practice and, and he embodies everything in his work. He's always got the hooks in his back or he's got like some cybernetic arm attached. And um, I, I think while, while I'm like not afraid to do it, uh, as most of you probably know, like the art world at the moment seems to be very focused on, it's like the century of self, you know, like everyone is the center of their own universe and it's this feedback of like just existing online where you might think you're a little more important than you are. And I, I think that's kind of a terrible emergent condition of, of most creatives and, and it works too, for some reason. Um, but yeah, if I need to demonstrate something that is not necessarily comfortable or like, um, whatever, I will I'll definitely do that, like, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I think it's not important that it's me at all, uh, because I'm trying to share human experience, you know, uh, like, this is not, it's not about me, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> Rather than destroying machinery, you're trying to destroy solitude. Sorry? Rather than destroying uh, machinery, well, the idea of the machine, you're perhaps trying to, uh, to critique or, or, or delegitimize discrete and solitary things in the internet and their interactions with, yeah. with the, the digital world. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why, you know, like with Celestial Bed, I worked with two other artists and we had to test that machine and make sure it kind of worked, but um, it is not, it's not built for us, it's a, it's an open proposal, it's, if anyone didn't want to use it for conception, we'll dust it off and do that, you know, um, and then, and then the project is finally complete, yeah. But it's also, you know, with Celestial Bed, I think it's interesting and it's something that you didn't explain because it's a, who, you know, it was commissioned, and it was commissioned by a very particular institution. And it's not a coincidence that it was commissioned by that institution. So maybe you can talk a little bit about it, because that's a very specific situation in Tasmania. Sure, yeah. Uh, Tasmania is a weird place in Australia. <laughs> and um, there is a, there's a museum called Mona, and it's um, run by a very eccentric a uh, wealthy person who, um, his name's uh, David Walsh, and he he won all his money, um, he's a card counter, he's like autistic or something, and he just made an extraordinary amount of money, and openly, he says, to evade tax, he built an art museum, and which has everything he wanted in it, including Jean Tinguely, several James Terrells, um, Picasso's, uh, an Egyptian mummy that he just wanted. Like, it, it's, it's insane. But uh, the museum's theme is sex and death, and so, of course, they funded <coughs> the sex machine. Um, yeah. Um, picking up on, on, on Dick's word, solipsism, and, and sex and death, and all of this, another, another thread comes to mind. 
you, you probably heard of Survival Research Labs yes. or Colleen. Yeah. So um, for those of you who haven't, uh, it, it's a group and a person who built these machines with claws and such that would grab onto a building and vibrate it and, you know, to the point where it would collapse or something. And they would basically robotic things that were quite insane and, mm -hmm. and destructive. But the thing about them was that they, were, uh, they weren't one machine at a time. Each machine had its own skills. But they were actually in a kind of strange Mad Max world of machines. These machines seem to always be on their own. Yeah. Have you made any that are more social? Um, Meaning between themselves, like not yeah. so existing to themselves, but in some kind of dialogue between. I do between think uh, like the, the light works particularly could exist together. Or the two, the, 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 um, um, the ceiling and the floor wall. There's, yeah, uh, there's, there's even more, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, this was like, you know, this is like all the, the light work, um, mm -hmm. so there's Big Dipper, there's um, Cryptid, uh, and then there's Azimuth and Steel the Sunshine, and like all, all these works are kind of in the same dialogue, and I feel like, yeah, they could exist in the same space. This is a series of work, you know? But they're not reacting to one another. No, it's not It's not like an orchestra in the same way survival research labs would be, but I'm yeah, fully in guess The question is, is more about emergence. Sorry? It's more about emergence, like if, whether they're open to, to altering their behavior based on some kind of not scripted uh, input. Yeah, that this one does something and that one does something, and let's say the light bulb breaks on the yeah. rolling one, and you know the, the change itself propagates across them. Yeah, it could be some kind of performance thing, definitely. I, I think, uh, but again, yeah, I've never really worked at that scale, really. You know, yeah, it's always it's hard enough. Yeah, it's hard group to pick one. And, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And they're quite large as well. Like you would need quite. A, really big space to house just these like four works really. Yeah. That's not a criticism, it's just an extrapolation. No, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah. I have a question. This is a more like a maybe rudimentary question. Um, so I, I think we were talking at the beginning about like themes that like occur throughout your work and I think it, especially in, in like this one for example, um, one theme is kind of like natural, like uh, the reference to like natural structures. I don't know if you would agree with that, mm -hmm. like throughout the whole entire body of work. And I was wondering just how you would like go about researching these structures and deciding which parts are important for the work and kind of like applying them. Yeah, well, I think it's like, uh, I, again, I, I, there's like really shitty points that I made at the start. I, I think like with this work, there's nothing but the structure uh, and the bulbs, and the goal was just to move the bulbs, and so like nothing is superfluous, and uh, nothing is like speculative. It's all elements that need to be there, and like I I tried to do that with all my work. I I think um, it can be inauthentic. It's like why are you even working with technology if um, your work is not about technology? You know, so yeah, I I think. It kind of happens out of necessity, or like that's just that's just my way of solving things, and I think that's the way I developed. That's how I know how to do things, and that's how things fit together for me. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of you do it enough, and that's that's what it looks like, I suppose. Do you ever like um, like before you design something like research in particular, like a natural structure that would be like fitting for the for the piece or for like the design? Sometimes, yeah, like with. Um, yeah, I think, like, I, I do these, I could probably pull it up, but, um, so with a lot of works I try and um, do these like proposal documents, um, and this, some, sometimes these things don't happen, which, you know, sucks, but then I get these proposal documents and I can send them to other people, where it's like the idea is consolidated and like, I guess it's like writing a paper, but they're much more visual and like, kind of spelling out the this is the, the document for like Little Sunfish, which was before I built anything and like, you know, ideas for scenes that could happen. Um, and then like some of the, some of the like reference material. Um, and then there's, there's other things like, I mean, this is a, this is another project I really wanted to do. It was a, 
getting a, a mobile traffic light unit and then um, outsourcing the, the selection of a red or green light to a bureau of goldfish. So like kind of flipping on the head the responsibility of these insignificant creatures. And yeah, but um, yeah, there's a, a lot of research goes into all these things and, the, and that research also cascades through other works. So, I mean, Golden Bureau, like the idea of this traffic light thing was actually, when I was researching that, it was like, I was invited to an exhibition with the theme of water and that was one of my concepts for the work. Like, in fact, initially I didn't think about little sunfish at all um, and then in my research I found um, some images of Fukushima and that's giant uh, barrels of water. So I uh, started researching that and then this whole other tangent was born. So yeah, um, I guess I could like share these things as well if you, if you want them. They're full of typos, I'm sure, but um, yeah. Sure, yeah, that'd be awesome because I haven't really gotten into like any the research portion of like education yet. I'm just like a first year student, so I'm definitely interested at how you like arrived to I think as long as it's like authentic, you know, if it's the things you're interested in, like then it should just like flow through you. It, it's kind of hard when you're trying to do something that's not, uh, you know, it's like becoming a, a desk job or something. It's a creative practice. It should be something that's about you and what you're interested in, uh, but just don't make it about you. <laughs> Is there anything else I could should do? Any questions? Last burning thoughts? I mean, I'll be around a lot next year as well, but well, while I got the big screen. <coughs> well, people can write to you. So. Sure, there's things in the chat, but I don't really know. Okay, he's good. <laughs> we'll just chat in person. He's got to go. He's gone. Um, yeah. Thank you.